Hello, and uh, thank you for everybody for uh, those three papers this morning. Um, we've been very lucky having those three papers together. They've introduced varied uh, concepts uh, this morning. We had Rika uh, talking first about uh, the Finnish Baltic Rim project, looking at issues balancing protection of underwater heritage with its visibility as well, and issues of climate change as well. Uh, Michael's paper about protecting coastal heritage in Ireland uh, and balancing hard defences with recording uh, those remains. And finally, uh, finishing with Gwyn's paper about whales and really harnessing technology, harnessing tech, particularly those weather models for predicting which tech should be used to record coastal heritage. Really very useful indeed uh, to see that. We've had a couple of uh, questions in so far. And Rika, we have a question I can direct to you if I may, first of all. Um, in how many countries is the concept or the idea of underwater landscape uh, being developed as part of marine uh, uh, strategic um, planning, I mean, marine spatial planning uh, processes? And how can we develop that concept uh, of underwater landscapes? How can we do that better? Um, thank you. Um, I have to say that I'm not entirely sure in how many countries exactly the, the concept is being used. Um, the underwater landscape concept was developed for Baltic Rim uh, projects, especially by, by researchers in Turku University, Laura Sesmeri, especially. Um, I know that similar concepts have been used in the UK and then especially in Denmark and the Southern Baltic area where they have significant um, issues with, with um, sea level rise with the submerged Paleolithic sites, for example. So they have um, sort of developed um, similar tools to, to govern their, their landscapes underwater. And um, in, in terms of developing it further, I think the concept could really benefit from cooperation with environmental agencies in, in countries like, uh, well, in Finland, especially our, our geological survey um, agencies and environmental institutes and, and similar obviously officials in, in other countries to really um, incorporate the, the environmental aspects into the landscape and obviously there's a there's a real lack in the Baltic Sea um, in the knowledge of how the environmental conditions and the climate change is affecting our heritage we we are have, we have not mapped it so far and haven't done any risk assessments or such. So I think that is really the way forward. That's brilliant, yeah. I mean, collaboration is the way forward, isn't it? And we've got so much in Cherish out of working with the Geological Survey of Ireland with geographers and archeologists as well. It, it really gives you that extra uh, span of skills. Thank you, Rika. Definitely, uh, yeah. Michael, if I can come to you, we've had a question um, asking, uh, when will National Monuments Ireland initiate a comprehensive programme of record and retreat along the western seaboard of Ireland, the archaeology of which is at extreme risk from climate change related coastal erosion? You touched on some of these issues in your paper. Could you expand briefly? Yeah, thanks, Toby. Um, and good morning, everyone. Um, it's a good question. We are certainly, as you'll have seen from the talk, aware of the risk of, of that coastal archaeology from, from the impacts of extreme weather. We would hope within the next year, I'll address the question in parts, we hope within the next year to have a, a, a multi-annual framework um, in place to react to, to incidents as they arise post-storm post event. Um, and to have that, I'll work with my colleague Pauline Gleeson and her team on that. There are some hard questions to be asked though, and I, we will look to, to be informed by the expertise and experience of our colleagues across Europe. Um, the question to be asked is, is jumping in and excavating, is that um, always necessary? Is it always advisable? Certainly in June environments um, where you have human remains often eroding, um, interventions such as excavation could actually make the problem worse. Um, so we need to uh, learn from what our colleagues are doing across Europe and how they are approaching this. Um, understand that Sometimes there is a policy of loss of, of let things go. Not everything can be mitigated against. Um, but the, the answer to the question is we are aware of the risk and we're looking to put in place those, those governance procedures through procurement in having call off consultants ready to be deployed as necessary. Splendid, thank you. And it's always a case of balancing expectations, certainly for those high profile sites, isn't it? 
and some of those may have an income uh, generation aspect to them as well as the cultural importance. Uh, so it's a shame to see them lost to the sea, but it's very difficult sometimes to protect it. And uh, we have a question uh, for uh, Gwyn as well. Um, uh, somebody's asking uh, what the annual budget uh, for the Marsh Coastal Monitoring Centre um, uh, is, uh, what, how its uh, uh, pilot coastal monitoring schemes have been initiated in Ireland. Um, but the Welsh programme looks to be one that we can be learned from. Yeah, so in terms of, I think it, it's probably impressed everybody, everybody's been watching your, program, your, your talk, Gwyn, in terms of what you've achieved with your budget, um, in terms of deploying technology and working with industry and universities as well. And somebody's asking uh, in Ireland, uh, over the Office of Public Works particularly, uh, what can be learned from that. But I guess a question to you, Gwen, is, is, is what would you say the, the take home messages from your project so far to other countries? Um, oh, that's, it's quite a broad question. So to summarise that, I mean, when we talk about budget, you could, we could always do with, with more budget. Um, as I highlighted in the presentation that the, there's intertidal areas or estuarine areas where there's a lot of people, large populations at risk of coastal flooding and we can't access them on foot. So we need aerial methods to do that. Currently, the uh, most accepted way is flying LIDAR, um, which is just too expensive for us. And hence, we're looking at other methods. And, and part of that rob robotic project was, was actually initially looking at remote control hovercrafts, not, not remote control cars, um, because we thought we'd be able to send out these vehicles on, onto the muddy areas to collect data. Um, but the reality of a hovercraft is the batteries don't last very long. Um, so, uh, so yeah, I, I mean, we're focusing, we've got a small budget, we'd like more money. Um, we've identified the gap and we're, we're just gonna look to collaborate and find other people that might be looking to collect data in those areas where we need it. Can people visit, uh, your, have you got a website or a portal? I see you mentioned that the, uh, your Geom weather model, historical weather model based on Copernicus data uh, could be applicable to other countries. Hopefully, yeah, with every project we do, we realise, especially if there's funding or we're public money, if there's anything that we can make for ourselves, it might be useful to someone else. So we deliberately start off trying to package things up as our end goal that other people might be able to use it. Um, so we're in the process of packaging up that project um, and we deliberately chose the Copernicus data set because you can choose any location on Earth and get historic meteorological reanalysis data for the last 40 years. Brilliant. We're coming to the end of our Q&A session. I, I think uh, just back to Rika, who started our session. I mean, one of the take homes from me from, uh, from your paper was the, the, uh, the concept of the seawater, the diver passing through the sea as, as a, an integral part of the maritime cultural landscape. And that's a really interesting concept. Is that one that's developed out of Finland? Um, yes, that's, I, we have uh, Laura Sesmeri from Turku University to thank, thank for, for, for that idea as well to really take into consideration that the water column as well as a sort of an integral part of an experience. And this, uh, I guess, uh, stems from us trying to get these concepts into spatial planning. So as a sort of, um, sort of an um, experience of landscape and how it affects people and stakeholders, divers in this case, and why this could be sort of an additional aspect, why these landscapes and, and these sea areas and the heritage within should, should be sort of taken broadly into consideration in spatial planning. So it's not just one dimensional, but there are all these other sort of aspects to consider as a sort of a whole um, experience <laughs> immersing yourself in the sea. Well, we see that even with Gwyn's paper and, and Michael's paper as well. I mean, the, the... The coastline is beautiful and exciting, but also can be quite dangerous and hazardous as well. And it's uh, and people love it. People love the monuments, uh, but then you also have to do intrusive work sometimes as well. So it's a, there's a mixture of feelings and, and issues there, aren't there? Well, I think we're coming to the end of this session by my watch. We want to keep to time. We're coming to midday. Um, so I'd like to uh, thank our three speakers this morning. Uh, for sharing their knowledge and their experience and their expertise. Um, everybody is doing incredible work and I think then everybody can see where their projects can develop with continued funding uh, and more communication with the public uh, and, and 
better ideas as well from the international scene as well. So it's been an interesting morning uh, and hopefully we can draw some of the themes that have come up this morning together at the end of our day where we have a panel discussion later on. So please do join us for that. So uh, Michael, Rika and Gwyn, thank you very much indeed and enjoy the rest of the day. Thank you. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Thank you.